Gregory Gelfand, that was awesome. Thank you so much for performing for us for an hour and 15 minutes here in Brooklyn. Uh, before we get started, just tell everyone who's listening at home where you're from, how you got into music. Just give them a little background. Um, well, I'm originally from St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, but I've been in America forever, so I'm all Americanized and stuff. I'm, uh, you know, with you guys now. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I started with music around when I was uh, 14 years old. You know, I just picked up a guitar. My father bought me a guitar. My father was actually a published musician during the Soviet Union. So, you know, he, oh, wow. had, yeah, he was like a, one of those rare cases that actually published some revolutionary songs and got paid a little for it, but only in Germany. You know, like, it's funny, he told That's me a story. Yeah, like, he stepped off the plane, and as soon as he stepped off the plane, they had a check for him. And he was very surprised what, what it was, because in the Soviet Union, you weren't really allowed to collect, uh, you know, uh, like, copyrights for your song. There was no such thing. But, but like, you know, in the German part of the Soviet Union, you could. So, like, when he was stepped off the plane, they actually literally just, you know, gave him some money. So it was kind of nice. Uh, but he inspired me a lot, and I think I'm, you know, I'm basically kind of, like, following in his footsteps, because uh, he... He was a musician and uh, he still is a musician, you know, very much. And uh, he was a revolutionary at his, you know, at, uh, during that time, you know, actually writing a lot of stuff that could have gotten him in a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, eventually did a little bit, you know, but uh, that's a different tale. But he was a big inspiration and, you know, he got me my first guitar, taught me my first few chords. And then from there, I just kind of just, you know, went on a journey, you know, started with heavy metal. Went into more, you know, Jimi Hendrix and more like, you know, I guess hippie music. <laughs> and then finally ended up, you know, with like a mix of electronica and, you know, people like New Deal, Disco Biscuits, you know, really kind of just trying to get those influences and inc incorporate them. Our team is uh, definitely big fans of the last two bands you mentioned. So <laughs> STS9. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I've been there. Uh, so you performed such an interesting set today, and I spent a lot of time listening to your catalog of music. Oh, thank you. And I don't think I've ever actually heard anything quite like it. So for anyone who is at home listening to this or watching this on YouTube, uh, we'll have a link below that you can actually watch the full set of uh, Gregory's performance today. But I would love for you to talk about how you got to the point of this super unique style of yours. The way I would describe it is just a constant evolution, a constant changing of vibes and grooves that just keeps you moving. And so I'd love to hear about how you arrived at that style. Um, well, you know, I, I really come from like a rock and roll background, you know, um, but the last like five to 10 years, music really took on a different change. And, and, and I think really the way I arrived there is I, I played in a lot of live bands and I realized something was missing there because like in deep house and house music, you know, there's something that involuntarily you just cannot stand there. The, the, the bass lows, the beats, you know, like you can't, you can't stand still, right? Like you just, you just keep going and going and, and some rock music you know it was missing that although some bands were trying to implement this change like sts9 or mm -hmm. disco biscuits right um <clears throat> But still, there's still like, you know, there's still a band and there's something missing. And, and, and so, and at the same time, the DJs, you know, they're great and they're awesome, but there was a live element that's missing. And, and some of the, you know, uh, electronic music is very redundant. And so I think, you know, one of the things that I really tried to do is to change that redundancy and, and then introduce some sort of a engineer banding. But, you know, at times maybe I've gone too far, too many noises, too many changes, you know, and that's what I've kind of heard. Uh, but that in itself actually created a distinction absolutely yeah i think that really helped uh, you know again i've never heard anything quite like what you, Thank you play which is very hard to do nowadays so high five on that one <laughs> thank you brother thank you so much it's really nice to hear uh, you know like uh it coming across, you know, because when I was putting these songs together, you know, there's such a wide spectrum of sounds that's available to a producer these days. And, and you know, it's very challenging, especially like as a band, you're, you're kind of limited to your instruments. And although like as a synth player, you have a wide array, you're still limited to a keyboard. Meanwhile, you know, as a producer, you, you have such a spectrum of sonic, you know, differences, you know, everything from, you know, some sort of a African string instrument to just like a La, la, wah, 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 you know, like, and, and, and it, I feel like you really can combine them across the board, you know, to get to that chill or that tingle. Cause that's really right. That's every producer's goal is to grab you and make you tingle. Right. 
Excellent. So I would love to take a deep dive now into your creative process. So uh, my first question would be, what would you say is an essential element to a fantastic song? Like, what do you feel like, what are you going for, an element that you're looking to put in your music that makes it your own, that makes it a really standout piece of music? Um, well, well, I think, you know, and I'm still working at this, right? I think really just taking somebody on a journey. I mean, I feel like a lot of the inspiration for the music that's made these days, you know, um, it doesn't go deep enough inside, you know, and, and, and I'm not saying that I do, you know, I'm also scratching, just scratching the surface. But, but what I really try to do is just like, you know, kind of like a Fibonacci or like a mandala broth, you know, just like, like take a leaf and describe it, you know, like, like, for instance, uh, one of the songs that we're going to be putting out soon is called Panorama. And that's really just about being on top somewhere like maybe on a mountain or maybe on top of a rooftop where eventually initially it's very beautiful and it's very soft and it's very calming kind of like the shoot we did today you know the beautiful sun but then it gets dark and it turns dark and you realize holy cow you know I'm really high up and I mean at least that's what I was trying to do is really to just kind of like start really soft but then kind of put the fear in you a little bit more lower frequencies more bass more wop dee wom you know like <laughs> kind of like hard synth sounds and it starts really soft you know like bongos and a little like uh, light disco piano you know so so you know that's really the transformation to go from like you're standing in a calm piece and you're standing on top but then you realize you're really high up and if it gives you that feeling then I somewhat succeeded. If not, hopefully, you know, it was just genier and bending enough and there was enough notes to at least make it unique. <laughs> awesome. That was a great answer. So when you're actually creating, do you have any sets of habits that you continually come to when you're creating music? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I always start with the beats. You know, I try to find an interesting beat and then it kind of takes a life of its own, you know, like I, I almost feel like I just try to move puzzle pieces like you, you hear a good sound, you hear a good synth, you play a few notes, you record maybe some guitar licks, maybe some flute licks, start playing with effects and then really just start layering and seeing, you know, like, well, this sounds interesting, but it doesn't really belong there. And it's like almost like a giant puzzle, you know, like, I mean, sometimes I'll get to 80 to 120 tracks, you know, like, and then I'll see like well, this doesn't belong here, that doesn't belong there. And it's like an endless movement of puzzle pieces to really make a, something fit where at least somewhat it flows into each other, you know? Otherwise it sounds really strange. And, and, and you know, in some of my songs, I'm guilty of that. You know, there's like hard cuts and things like that. Um, but still, you know, I'm really trying to incorporate a lot of like melodies, a lot of progressions, a lot of synchronizations that, you know, keeps electronic music from that repetitiveness. Mm. So where do you pull most of your inspiration from? Do you have a set of artists or a specific artists that you really like love and pull inspiration from? Well, I mean, I, I definitely anything by Juno Deep. I mean, those guys, wow, you know. Yes. Right and, and uh, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy to say we recently got signed to uh, tracks and Symphonic and I definitely some tracks, some old school house, you know, like uh, uh, <laughs> record pressing tracks you know um but really i think some of these younger newer artists who are really setting the standard for sound and frequencies like they really play with the analog sense with a lot of the effects to get to a certain frequency where like you're really interested in what is that like I, I've literally like played some of these songs in like a park, you know, at some open parties or um, even in a club and, and you see people stop and turn around and are like, what, what is that? Because it's really this, these frequencies, low and high, that are made to do that. And these guys can really, like I, I'm still struggling with those frequencies. I'm more about like the composition and progression. But these guys really concentrate on hitting these frequencies and, and then progressing you through them. And that's kind of, you know, where I'm trying to get to as well. That's a perfect segue. So you were talking about uh, getting signed. So for all the young budding musicians that are looking to do just that, I'm, I'd love for you to share that process, the things you've learned, some, some lessons that you could teach to others on how to get there, how to get signed to a label, if that's their goal. Well, I, I think the most important thing is first uh, to self-release. And when you do self-release, uh, do some PR with that self-release. Not a lot, just a little, just enough so that the PR is not fake and so that the PR is actually about you and your process and what the message you're trying to portray or the character you're building or the storyline you're making. That's very key because if you release without PR, it's kind of useless. But once you've released that, then you have something, you know, and you shouldn't release too many of those because 
you should show what you have to give to the world and then kind of show it around because people are always looking for new artists and new art to make you definitely know? Am. yeah and, and it's and there's so many artists now i mean the mar market is drowned but everybody's always looking for something interesting and unique and even if you don't have something interesting and unique if you just have a good sound um you know if you listen to your critics so to say um you can really get somewhere with some of these other bigger people like owners of record labels and and and, and i guess the journey would be start with lower record labels easy more approachable record labels and then once you take self-release uh, uh, more approachable record labels, then you could try to approach the bigger labels and, and get distribution. But you also have to remember, you know, in this day and age, in our digital age, you have to do a lot of the legwork. You have to figure out what your journey is as far as PR. They can help you and they can definitely help you monetize quicker, you know, as far as record companies and distribution platforms. But it's really up to you to build your own report by performing, by, um, you know, now a lot of the streaming, you know, that really helps to project around the world and and really to build your music out and build your fans out because without a fan base without a fan funnel you know you can't really progress your music so let's dig into that so how what tip would you give to someone to help them create an actual fan base to help them get to that point um well you know I, i'd say go back to the basics you know i'd say um we're in New York City, so if you hear <laughs> some some ruckus behind us, people yeah. getting rough. <laughs> yep. Um, I, I think it's very important to understand your goals and understand your uh, capabilities. If you understand that, then you could kind of create a journey for yourself and understand where you can get to financially from music, as well as you know popularity-wise. So. Even for bedroom producers, there's always a chance if you understand your audience and how to reach out to them. And, and there's so many different mediums now. So I think concentrating, obviously, on digital marketing, digital media, and having a plan, having a campaign that's like templated for each release. I mean, there's so many different products, things like Hootsuite um, that allow you pre-program for months, if not even a year in advance, what you're going to release, how it's going to look like uh, different social platforms, you know? And, you know, it's really putting in the time. If you put in the time, there's a lot of things you can do now that you couldn't long ago. Now, that doesn't mean that it's easier now. It's actually harder because when you get signed, it's much, it still doesn't, you know, it's not like the old days, you know, you'd get signed and sorry you were made. No, now you have to still do a lot of work. And fortunately uh, we were signed by tracks. Like I mentioned, we were also signed by some Congratulations, fine. by the way. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, we're really excited. You know, we're uh, working with Rachel Kane. Uh, she was a real inspiration because, um, you know, during the pandemic, uh, there was a full shutdown. We couldn't play any more shows. And this was, you know, unbearable because <laughs> the biggest thing for me is really being in front of an audience and, and, and connecting with them that electricity to me it's like intoxicating and that's my favorite thing in the world honestly um, and it, there was a full shutdown but she kept the record playing so to say and she started the stream show that she does every Saturday night with tracks records and we've been streaming with her every Saturday night for you know since the pandemic started actually um, and she kind of kept it going and she, she, she held it down. So it really, <laughs> it really helped us, you know, gave us an inspiration to kind of like progress and do more and put out more music and use the time productively instead of just kind of being locked up and confused and scared. And so sad. for all our listeners at home, I'm hearing consistency is key. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, a plan, I think, is key, definitely. Like, you, you can't just, like, make music and have no plan. You have to have a plan and correct expectations. Like, if you put out your own music, you know, don't think you're going to hit it somewhere all of a sudden. Put in the time, create a Facebook group, have a little show, start having little followers, and then refer to other people, you know, like uh, as far as smaller record companies, you know, smaller uh, production and release distribution companies. They're there to help, you know, like places like Symphonic, for instance, they're a little bit of a high up, higher up in, in, in the food chain because they actually evaluate your music. They have their own playlists and they curate them. So when you release, you could actually let them know, okay, four to six weeks from now, which is their norm, you're going to release and they help you get placement. And that placement helps you get more gigs and the gigs help you get more placements. And so it's like a good catch 22 <laughs> instead I, of a excellent. bad one. And, and I think, you know, a lot of the artists and musicians, 
you know, they really struggle with the first few steps, you know, and, and, and I'm kind of there as well. And, and, and you, even the famous people, they always go back to these first few steps. It's just that how famous people and successful people get there is by keep doing the same thing. You fall off the horse, you get back on it, you know, and you ride somewhere where the fields are fine for riding, you know. <laughs> So are there any things that you do on a consistent basis that help you come back to those first few steps? Like what, yeah, again, what habits would you say that you, you come to that help you be consistent? Well, I think uh, really building a model for yourself as far as releases, as far as um, expectations as well. And, and like, for instance, if you have a decent PR person, you know, they don't cost that much. And then with each release, they actually do some damage for you, get your placement, get some articles, get some interviews for you. You'll see yourself making headway and, and listen to your audience, listen to your fans. They'll tell you how it is. If you're out there playing and you got some art piece and you're just convinced that it's so good and you drop it and it's just like... No reaction, crickets. you know, like it's right. either crickets or like even worse. People are like, what's going on right now? Maybe <laughs> uh, we should go over there. It's safer or something <laughs> or like, you know, it's too quiet or it's, you know, I, I think it's very good to experiment. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an electronic producer, but but it's good to experiment. Even if you're in rock or other engineers, play un a track to your audience that they love, that they go crazy for and then play your own and then see how they react. What's the reaction? Does it keep them going? If it keeps them going, you got something there. But if it doesn't, that's a great tip, you know, like see their reaction, you know, see if they like it. And, it, and if, if they don't like it at some point, figure out, well, why didn't they like talk to them? Ask them, well, what didn't you like? So you DJ a lot, right? So you get you get the opportunity to really test your music out in, in the field with fans, even though I know we've had COVID happening for the last few months, you've still been doing some sort of events that are with smaller crowds. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. I mean, we were fortunate enough uh, to do a big festival like Elements recently. Um, and that was a bigger crowd. I think uh, 500 was their capacity. And, and they actually tested on a f Thursday and that was uh, required and then tested you again on a Friday. And I think uh, it's somehow New Jersey let them, gave them a sound ordinance and everything, and they were able to perform. So that was a very interesting experience for us. Um, but yeah, we've been, we, we started, you know, when COVID just happened, we started doing a lot of like private house uh, gigs, you know, like some birthday parties. And I think all of the DJs started doing that, you know, like they just dropped out. Then really a lot of streaming. Streaming is key because, you know, all the concerts you do, if you're a local DJ, you're not going to hit anybody in UK or like, India or Africa and there's fans there you know there's a base there and and you know you could build an expectations if you're performing like let's say in the afternoons you're still hitting UK you're still hitting Australia you're still hitting time zones that people might be interested in your music and and, and if you're just concentrating on playing live here you're not reaching out there so what we've been doing is actually we've been doing these small stream shows where we invite people over you know and and um, we do like you know and then we stream out we stream out to Mixcloud from for our profile we stream for tracks records uh we had this uh whole slew of djs in a coalition which was called house to house party you know there, that was going for a while um and and you know really we, we just try to do what we can to get fans besides just our immediate uh, um shows but there have been a few shows you know and, and it's, it's been kind of interesting because you get much more intimate with people you can't do 500 or a thousand people or even 1500 nothing you know maximum 30 50 you know so Maybe a hundred, you know, if you're like slipping in somewhere, you know, and, and, and at least in New York City, in this area, that's how it is. I know that in Atlanta and some other places, they have bigger shows. They have drive-in shows and, and, and other things that they're still doing, um, that the numbers are a little bigger. But, but, but that gives you a chance, actually. That gives you a chance to interact with your audience and see, well, why did he just leave? If there's only 30 people here, why aren't they dancing on the floor, pumping their fists, you know, and making noises like, woo, and we, you know, like if you, if some, if you're, you're not getting them there, something's wrong. Like something, right. you got to do something different, you know? So you mentioned to me, uh, in a, a phone conversation we had the other day that you were, you actually have a group of musicians that you talk with on a weekly basis. So I'd love if you could chat about that and tell us how that's actually helped you progress as a musician and an artist because I think that's something that most musicians could probably do. Most musicians have other friends that are musicians. So what tips would you actually give to someone if they want to start a group of their own, you know, musicians to help inspire and lift each other up? 
So, so our group, uh, yeah, it's a, first I'll tell you a little bit about the group and then I think people can take some tips, you know, because it really helps, you know, um, the group is called Artists Anonymous and I didn't start it, but I became a member and I helped propel it. And what we do is we meet Mondays at nine o'clock and we have different types of guests, you know, that are brought on record company owners, smaller and bigger, um, PR folks, um, playlist curators, uh, radio show directors, um, there's just all kinds of guests that help you understand, well, what am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? We had this one guy who was Madonna's guitarist for the first four albums, toured with a hole in oats for 20 years. And he, and he was really just this amazing studio musician. And he explained like how he got there. You know I mean? I don't know if you, you know, this song by CNC music factory. Uh, yeah, of course we all know. So that. that's New him right going. Unts, unts, uh, really? Yeah. So he's got wow. all of these tracks that he's a part of and that he monetized on, and and so you know he was a great guest as as many others. You know, it's very interesting to hear their perspective to get some hints from them, and maybe subscribe to their services. You know, because that also helps them. You know, if it's PR services or you know, I actually reached out and we're probably going to work uh, with the studio musician. You know, I'm I'm really excited about that, and and so this group. You know, we meet we listen, we talk to each other and it really kind of helps things go and it helps you feel that you're not alone because when you're alone, it's very tough. And what we've also started to do, we're now, you know, curating playlists with these folks, you know, that are on this call and to help build fan bases and to help, you know, kind of create a funnel to help work with their Facebook, Instagram, you know, uh, any social media that they may have and to tie it all together and then eventually start having live shows with them, you know, when things start going well, because, you know, like you take one pencil, it breaks very easily, but you take a stack of pencils, guess what? It ain't breaking. <laughs> I like that analogy, you know? So, uh, I'm going to rattle off a few questions here sure. for you. Um, thanks for having me, by the way, dude, this, this is was, so this awesome. Amazing. This is so, yeah, cool. like Guys, so exciting. This roof is so pretty. And, and, uh, you know, I mean, that sunset was just magical. It was. Everyone who's listening, if you get a chance, you can watch the full set. That will be on YouTube. Uh, there'll be a link again in the description to watch the full set. Uh, so I'm going to rattle off some quick questions and give you some quick answers. And sure. Then we'll wrap it up. Sounds uh, good. Who's the artist you pull the most inspiration from and why? Um, I would say Jimi Hendrix. Oh, interesting. And... Um, I, I have to say more than once because I'm gonna, you know, like I <laughs> like a few things, right? So I, I would say Jimi Hendrix and um, Chopin. Oh wow! Know. Okay. Yeah, Two because of the spectrum. Yeah, I mean they're all really fast with notes, uh -huh. but one is really like he rips it. He's really raw. Well, Chopin, he can be raw, but in a very gentle classical music kind of way, you know, and and his progressions are just you know phenomenal you know love it so, okay next one um what was the most pivotal moment in your musical career so far um i think actually getting signed by tracks and and symphonic you know that was a very big thing for us um only because like we've released before we've self-released and we were signed to a very small label but there was really no traction and there was really no interest uh, but now, you know, we're sitting about at this point, about four weeks before the release, we've already secured several interviews. We're already, the songs are not even released. They're already getting put on playlists. So we're, we're starting to get traction that I'm like, you know, I'm super excited about, you know, and, and, and on occasion people are actually coming up to me, it's like, uh, you know, I heard of them, you know, I heard of Mygasm and I'm like, wow, really? It's like something's getting across. This is very exciting, you know, like for me as a musician, producer. I love hearing that. That's ex I'm excited for you. Congratulations you. again. Uh, third question. What is the most impactful thing you do to help yourself be creative? Um, I think uh, traveling is one thing, but I think much more than that is really just loving your friends, loving your family, you know, loving if you have a partner, you know, I think... It really creates and resonates certain frequencies that and, and gives you certain peace that you can't create otherwise, because I feel music is an intoxication, right? So like mm. you're trying to intoxicate people and make them feel better, right? So if you're not feeling good, how can you make them feel better? So if you're feeling great, you know, you know how to create that environment, you know how to create those frequencies so others can partake. Uh, but if you're sad and I mean, you could, you could, that's also a big release, right? I mean, like sadness, anger, those are the best. Um, but, but you know, if, if you can't get back to a good state of mind, it's hard to bring other people there with you. Excellent. Excellent. I love that. I completely agree with that. Looking back, what piece of gear would you have not purchased? Why? <laughs> Oh, man. Like the number one total Ooh. waste of money. Man, I have so much <laughs> gear. So much waste of money. 
Oh, Lordy. Um, First one that comes to mind. Oh, man. Uh, I'm like, honestly, I'm, okay, I know, I know. D, DJ, not 200, 100. So because the DJ, DJ no, no, D, DJ 200 and not 400, because the 400 actually is great for mobile gigs. Like if you're completely mobile, it's very easy, it's like super light. Um, and it has everything. It has like the buttons for loops. It has like highs, lows, effects, you know, like in the controller. DDJ 200 doesn't have anything Bluetooth ready. It looks really cool. You could bring it with you, but you still need your computer. I mean, you still need a computer for the other one as well, but I mean like to actually change the effects, to set up the loop. So, I mean, it's like, you know, it's a very small, all the other equipment I really like. Honestly. <laughs> oh, there we go. All right. So everyone who's listening, don't buy that. <laughs> uh, what is the, what is your proudest moment as a musician so far? You know what? Sitting here with you. I'm really enjoying this. You know, like oh, today wow. was really fucking, well, <laughs> edit <okay>. that. <laughs> today was really, really cool. You know, the sunset, everything, you know, this interview and other interviews we've done recently. Um, also Elements, Elements was amazing, you know, the way all those people started dancing. We were doing silent disco, completely ran out of headphones, there was a line of people, and we were playing against the headliner at the same time as Bedouin, and, you know, because of sound ordinance, they had to stop, but we kept going. So our set lasted four hours instead of like an hour and a half. And nobody stopped us and everybody partook. So it was really, really nice. And at some point, and because it was really cold and we were outside, but in the tent it was really warm and there was like a couple of ladies that came up. They were dressed in lingerie and they refused to, and you know, entrench themselves in this cold and they just continued dancing and dancing and keeping themselves warm this way. And they were like, we support you, we support you, we're here for you, you know, and it was just so great, you know. And and actually, uh, somebody actually came and just took video of all of it, you know, and he was just a random gentleman. And, and he showed me, he was like showing me all these people that are dancing throughout the area because, you know, they weren't all in one area. Right. But there was like 150 headphones and they were all done, you know, so. Right, right. And a lot of times when you're performing, you know, I'm a musician as well. You can't always. And a good one. Thank you. I've seen you play. <laughs> I have even played with you, sir. Yeah, that's true. You're just fine, that's I must say. <laughs> Thank you. High five. High five. <laughs> so to wrap it up, one big tip of advice that you would give for a budding musician, someone who's just starting or is they, they know this is the path for them. One thing that number one takeaway. Um, I'd like to do two things because one is just not enough. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, there's 10 things, but really let's stick to two. So first thing is most important. Don't give up and believe in yourself. If you don't believe in your art, nobody will believe in your art. Even if it's terrible, have that confidence. Yep. Uh, number two, use karma help people they'll help you you know what i mean use their art to further your art you know because it's the only way to go there's really the only way to push your art is with other people's art so if they enjoy it you enjoy it and you share audience gregory thank you so much for performing for us today this was such a cool experience Man. i will remember it forever <laughs> thank you for having us absolutely Senator buddy Man, thank you